Um, and so we're, we're glad to, to have him with us again. Um, and then right behind me here is Zach Terrell. Uh, Zach. Um, okay. Oh, uh, 12 through 17. Did you come in at 12 or 13? 12, yeah. Okay. And uh, Zach also uh, was a big part of our leadership uh, on campus, uh, our FCA group. Um, again, a, a record setting quarterback. Uh, that uh, took us to the Cotton Bowl and a MAC championship in 16. Um, and that was a really good year for me because the Cubs won the World Series too, so that was great. So that was a really good year for me as a Bronco and a Cubs fan. Uh, and then John Wasink, uh, here to my left, John. John is our most recent, uh, just, uh, uh, just graduated or just got his MBA and, and played this last year. And... Uh, Another great quarterback at Western, just in a long line of great quarterbacks, and also just a really important part of our leadership um, in our FCA group at Western. Um, and, uh, you know, so these, these guys are more than just pretty faces. Um, they, uh, they uh, when it looks, when you look at accolades that they've gotten over the years, um, a couple of them stand out. And all three of these guys were up for the Werfel Trophy, which is goes to the uh, the scholar athlete in the country that most exemplifies uh, community service. And I know that all three of these guys were very involved in in community service throughout their time at Western. And uh, both Tim and John won that award, um, and that gave us the distinction of being the only university in the country to have two uh, winners of that trophy. Um, and uh, before you feel sorry for Zach, okay, Zach uh, was uh, the winner of the uh, Campbell Trophy his senior year, the year we went to the Cotton Bowl, uh, which goes to the top scholar athlete in, uh, in the country. Um, so that was, uh, that's not shabby. <laughs> Uh, so all three of these guys, tremendous scholar athletes, great in community service, and great uh, Christian young men uh, that I've had the pleasure to get to know. Um, and just really, like I said, leadership in FCA and uh, was very important to what we do on campus. They've impacted a lot of lives. Um, and then we have over here on the end of my left, uh, Craig Darling. And Craig is... Um, <laughs> Craig is a team chaplain, and he's been uh, kind of a spiritual shepherd for all of these guys uh, throughout their career at Western, and uh, he's also on staff with me at, at, uh, F uh, at FCA, um, and uh, he's been uh, uh, an important part uh, of their lives, I know, while they were on campus, um, and uh, we're, we're glad to have him with us. Uh, he is also... Not, not a shabby athlete himself. He played football at the University of Iowa. Um, so he's got a little background there. Um, and then we have over here uh, to my right, David Evans. And David and I um, got to know each other uh, at Western a little bit. And uh, uh, David uh, is on staff um, there in the video production department. And he uh, also has his own uh, channel uh, on the edgy, edgy channel, okay, uh, that, uh, and uh, with his own Christian um, music station. And um, so he is going to be our moderator for tonight. And uh, so anyway, with, uh, with that said, the last thing I want to say before I open with prayer, um, if any of you, uh, especially you middle school and high school uh, athletes that might be here, um, if you are interested, and you don't know if you've got an FCA chapter at your school, or you know you don't, or you think you do and you want to get plugged in, come and see me afterwards, and I'd love to, love to help you get plugged in. Uh, if you don't have a chapter at your school, let me know. We'll help you get one going. Uh, if you college students, um, we do have a really great chapter at Western. Uh, you don't have to be a varsity athlete at Western to be a part of it. If you were a high school athlete and that's kind of your thing, it's your language, uh, we'd love to have you be a part of that so we can get you information on that also. Uh, so with that, let's, uh, let's open a prayer and we'll get going. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day that you've given to us. Uh, we thank you 
Uh, just for your many blessings, thank you for the beautiful day. Uh, just mindful of those blessings you give to us. Thank you most of all for your son and the life that we have through him. Uh, we thank you for uh, the ministry of FCA and the opportunities we have to impact the lives of athletes and coaches. Uh, through that, uh, we thank you for Calvary Bible Church and them partnering with us in this event. And uh, we thank you for each of these men up here and uh, their stand for, for Christ. And, um, and we just pray that you might bless this evening and uh, you might get the glory from it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. David, take it away. All righty. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, why don't we start off by just talking about where you are now since college. What, what has your life been like? Uh, have you, your careers, your family life? Uh, why don't we start with you and uh, Tim, and why don't you talk about what's going on in your life right now? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you, and thanks for the opportunity, Mike and, and Craig, to be here. Um, I'm the elder statesman in the group, so I'm the oldest, but uh, uh, I'm 33. Um, uh, it's hard to believe, but it's been almost 12 years now since uh, I finished my senior season at Western. Um, we're back in the area, so my wife, Michelle, was a basketball player at Western. Um, her family lives here. She's a Kalamazoo Christian alum, and so we're back here in Kalamazoo. Um, we've been married 10 years. Uh, my oldest son, Daniel, is five now, and my daughter, Emma, is two and a half. Um, professionally, I work at, I work at Stryker. Uh, I'm also involved in, I see a lot of athletes here, uh, the Dome Sports Center and Next Level Performance. I'm on the, the board of directors and an owner there. Uh, working on that in the miracle field and some of the things that we do there. Um, and so that's kind of the, the basics on us. We're, we're excited to be in this community. We love Kalamazoo and uh, are thankful for the many things that Western and, and Kalamazoo have given our family. Wonderful. Awesome. How about you, Zach? Yeah, so uh, let's see. It's been four, oh, this be the fifth season that since I've graduated. So I'm uh, married to my college sweetheart as well, Maggie. She was a cheerleader. So you had the cheer captain and the quarterback. We try to keep it as stereotypical as possible. Um, so uh, we live in uh, Vicksburg, so we're still in the Kalamazoo area. I work at Ziegler Auto Group. Uh, I've been there now for three years uh, since I came back. Um, just like Tim, love the community, love being involved. Um, and uh, FCA obviously played a huge part in my life, not only helping me introduce me to my wife, which was huge, but also getting me through college. So yeah, I'm also really excited to be here um, with Craig and Mike, who played an instrumental role in my development through college. So, um, but yeah, we're, we're happy to be here. Wonderful. Okay, John, how about you? Uh, I'm 23. Um, I just had my last season of college football this past fall. So pretty fresh off it, I guess you could say, about a year. Um, I got married back in January, so I've been married for nine months. <laughs> just you got it all months. figured should, out, don't you? I should know exactly how many. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so just just been married for nine months, so that's pretty fresh too. Um, that's going well. My wife is pregnant with our first child. She's due in about five or six weeks, so we'll have our first child about November 1st, I think it's due, so. Yeah, that's coming up, um, and I just started a job for Allied Mechanical Services here in Kalamazoo a couple months ago, so we live in Grand Rapids, um, but I make the commute most days down here for work, so that's kind of where I'm at. Awesome. I haven't forgotten about you, Craig, but we'll ask you some questions a little later on. We'll stick with some of the football guys, and I'm really interested to hear some of the stories, some of the highlights. Do you guys have any highlights or any moments uh, from your college career that really sticks out that you'd like to share? We'll start with you again, Tim. Yeah, you know, there's so many, and I think um, you don't always remember specific games or scores or plays, but, you know, you remember um, the relationships and the, and the guys that you, you played with and fought hard with and had success and had struggles. Um, you know, I think for me, just at a family level, uh, a really special moment was uh, in 2008, uh, which would have been my second to last season, um, we played the University of Illinois, um, but it wasn't a home game in Kalamazoo. It was actually in Detroit at Ford Field. And um, it was special because my grandfather um, was on the 1952 Rose Bowl team at the University of Illinois before there were face masks and all that good stuff. And so growing up, um, he just passed away a couple of years ago, but, um, you know, uh, he's, I'm named after him. My son is named after him. Um, he is someone that I uh, was heavily influenced by. We had a very special relationship. Um, always wanted to do what he did in a football sense. 
And so to have the opportunity to do so, to have him there watching, to play his alma mater, uh, to beat his alma mater, <laughs> um, which is very important. Um, and Ron Zook was also the head coach at Illinois at the time, and he, his first head coaching job was at my high school years ago. So there were just all these really neat ties, people from home, my family. Um, so that was a special day all around. Wow, that's awesome. That's it. That it really is awesome to be able to have the family connection there. So Zach, how about you? Any, uh, any special highlights that you can think uh, of? I don't really know if I need to answer this question. It's probably pretty obvious. Um, <laughs> but I'll give you one that most people probably don't know. My first ever play was versus Michigan State, the year we went one and 11. So uh, Tyler Van Tuvergen actually started the game. Tyler was a fifth year senior. I was a redshirt freshman. And uh, early on in the first quarter, he gets knocked out of the game by the future Rose Bowl champs. And uh, Michigan State had one of the top defenses in the country. And sure enough, it was uh, my time to shine. And I get called in and uh, throw a touchdown on my first pass. And uh, that was a pretty cool first pass, first play. And then it was pretty much all downhill from there. But uh, <laughs> that was a good way to start. <laughs> so for all you kids, it's not, not really how you start. It's how you finish. So finish a little stronger than I did. But honestly, that's, uh, that whole season where we're at 1-11 is honestly what I look back to the most. I don't look to the 2016 season really at all because I learned so much about myself, uh, my teammates, our community. Uh, and that season alone, because you really got to really learn who you were. And it, you find out who you are in times where they're the toughest. And that truly was a test um, mentally, physically, and certainly spiritually and emotionally. Um, when you're, you know, in the front row like you guys are in classrooms and teachers are, you know, talking about how terrible the quarterback is. Little do they know you're sitting in the front row. So um, there's a lot of situations like that that really built a lot of character and uh, a lot of thick skin and kind of, is the reason why we were able to, to build and have the season we did in 2016. So that's really what I look back towards. Awesome. And it's a really difficult question, I'm sure, to ask to answer because there's so many different things that I'm sure come to your mind. John, how about you? Yeah, so just a quick fun fact about Zach's um, game at Michigan State. I was actually at the game, so I actually saw your first touchdown pass. You were getting recruited by Michigan State, weren't you? Correct, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> of course you were. <laughs> well, I didn't... <laughs> They didn't offer me anything, so I <laughs> they should have. Anyway, yeah. Um, as Tim said, I don't know, both of them said, you know, there's so many moments you look back on. I don't know. For, I guess for me, one of the things that sticks out the most, um, my first ever start and my first ever college snap was actually at USC, University of Southern Cal. So I was a pretty, you know, looking back on it, I was pretty ignorant going into it, didn't really know what I was doing, but... That was just kind of a cool moment, and that was actually a really cool trip. We didn't end up going to a bowl game that year, but since that was our first game, we went out there like four or five days ahead of time and just had a blast um, as a team, just hanging out with, with each other. Um, that was before school started, too, so we just had a blast out there in Southern Cal, so I just remember a lot of those moments with those guys out there. Awesome. Awesome. A lot of memories of the global uh, experience um, more than just the detailed plays. Uh, what character qualities did college football build in you guys um, during Western's time and also even past Western after you graduated? We'll go with Tim again. We'll go John. circle. Um, you know, I think um, if I could summarize all of it down into, you know, a sentence or two, I, I think um, what college football really, really taught me if I, if I look back is that you know, with the Lord, and I think that's a key, key component of this, right, and, and I think we'll all get into that. That was a period of growth for all three of us, you know, in these guys' stories, but, you know, with the Lord, you can accomplish far more than you thought, and part of it is because he's working in and through you, but also part of it is, is um, this, this season of growth and character, uh, whether it's a coach pushing you to and even beyond what you thought were your limits mentally, um, for me, you know, uh, we'll, we'll probably talk about this later, but a hidden part of my story a lot of people don't really know uh, super well is I had a lot of injuries. Um, you know, if the timing of my injuries had been any different, I, I really probably never would have played at all. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to have them either be an injury I could play through or they were at the end of a season rather than, you know, game three or game four. We just saw Saquon Barkley go down this week, you know, what unfortunate timing. But through those experiences, um, you know, C.S. Lewis says it, you know, Pain is the Lord's megaphone, right? Pain is God's megaphone to a sleeping world. And I think for me, there were many times where he grabbed my attention and showed me I could, I could accomplish far more than I ever thought. 
uh, with him and through adversity. And so I think that, that piece of, of grit and adversity, uh, mental and physical toughness were, were big things that continue to serve you well because you, as you grow as a person and a leader, you continue to face more problems and more challenges and, um, you know, trying to be a father and working. I mean, there's just over and over you're going to face hard things. And so having the ability to, to um, trust the Lord in those situations and to continue to be able to push yourself is really key. Yeah, I, love, I love how you put that. I like how you, I thank you for sharing that. Zach, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, college football and college in general really defined a lot of things for me. Um, you know, Tim touched on faith. It really defined my faith because it, you had to make it your own. Um, college football defined what leadership means to me. It means influencing others. You know, you have an opportunity to not only influence your teammates, your coaches, but a community, a school, um, and then also define success. You know, how we see success. Most people see it as by trophies and winning. And like I just said, uh, that's not really how I've seen it. Success is the peace of mind you get knowing you did everything you could to be the best you could be. John Wooden says that. So um, it really taught a lot of those characteristics and how to define them and how I define them and moving forward now throughout my life, those define me each and every day. When I go to work, when I come home, my wife gets sick and tired of me saying, how was your, when she says, how was your day? I say elite still because <laughs> words have meaning to me. They define my life. They defined it when I was playing and they define me now. And um, I think that's the biggest thing is uh, defines, like I said, it defines my faith and just how I, how I live my life. Wow, awesome. How about you, John? Yeah, I think um, hearing these guys talk, I think one word that I kind of popped into my head was kind of perseverance. Um, you know, like Zach said, you know, perseverance through whatever you're going through, the challenges, the tough times, kind of, you know, that perseverance kind of defines who you are and it kind of helps you build everything in your life, whether it be faith or football, um, you know, injuries. Um, not playing um, your first year or whatever it is, you know, there are a lot of things that kind of produce perseverance and that perseverance turns into something greater in the end. Um, so I think they're just, perseverance is kind of the word that came to me. All right. So let's talk academics. I know that academics is a huge part of any college experience, especially um, football. Um, and I know that you all had done very well in your undergraduate um, career and also went on to earn your MBAs, which I thought was really awesome. Um, so how did you balance everything, uh, your football, your academics, your social life, your family life, and, and your spiritual lives? So how did you balance that, Tim? It's a good question. It's not easy. I mean, um, you know, it, we all had to do study table freshman year. And, and the point of that wasn't so much... Um, punishment as it was habit formation, right, of getting in a routine. I mean, you know, I can remember freshman year before I started playing, I was on, on you know, the red shirt squad, and, you know, we would lift at 6, 6.30 in the morning, you know, and then you'd hustle off to class at 8 a.m. You have class from, like, maybe 8 to 11, 8 to 11.30, grab a quick lunch, get to the stadium, watch some film, official meetings start at, you know, maybe 1.30 or 2, go through your meetings, practice. By that time, it's, like, 6 o'clock. Some guys are running off to night class. Others are you know, eating dinner, then going to that study table, maybe of FCA at 9 p.m. that night. I mean, it's, that's, a, that's a really full day, right? You're talking 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., get up, do it again in some form. And it's not that way every single day, but the point is um, discipline, structure, routine, right? And so I think what I've learned, and I, I, I think this still rings true in my own life, is um, prioritization, time management, and then you only have maybe an hour or two to get, thing, get these three things done. It's got to be done, right? And so it filters distractions, it helps you focus on what's the most important thing now. And I think, I think those type of habits are really, really key and still probably serve all three of us well in some form. How about you, Zach? Yeah, definitely say, I mean, Tim touched on it, routine, obviously. Uh, as quarterbacks, we, seem, we tend to be routine-oriented. But also sacrifice. Like, what are you willing to give up for something you've never had? Right? A lot of people say they want to be a Division One athlete. A lot of people say they want to be a quarterback. Well, do you really want to be a quarterback, or really, do you really want to be a Division One athlete? Do you really want to be the academic Heisman? Do you really want to be a World Trophy winner? Because that requires a lot of sacrifice, and that's just the reality of it. I mean, a lot of uh, all three of us didn't spend a lot of time at parties. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time doing other things. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on our craft, studying, you know, watching film. It doesn't sound glamorous because it's not, but at the end of the day, it produces results because we were willing to sacrifice. So, like Tim said, with all those things, but also, what are you willing to give up? 
Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot to add to those two guys. Um, I think, you know, sacrifice and priorities, really just setting your priorities straight. Um, so, you know, if one of your priorities is FCA, mark it on your calendar for every week and, and don't miss it. You know, um, schoolwork, get your schoolwork done, football, do what you got to do. Um, just prioritization and, and really, like Zach said, just sacrifice, being, being uh, really putting your mind to it and getting it done really is what it com- comes down to. And just be really smart like Tim and John. That helps a lot, too. <laughs> well, I think, I, not to hijack, but I, Zach, you said the word. The word is sacrifice. I was talking to a young athlete because it just made me think of it, all the young athletes here, not long ago. And he was talking about just decisions like his friends and peers were making and his dad was there. And, and they kind of made the comment like that he's like, I'm lonely. And I was kind of like, yeah, because you've told me, you know, you want to be a Division One or two baseball player and you're not making the choices that others are making on the weekend. And so therefore you are alone some weekends. Right. And that but that's the cost of greatness. Right. You're on a different path than maybe those other other individuals. And you know, even in a football locker room with a lot of great athletes, we all saw that too. different choices. And it, the hard choice now pays off later and put things into perspective. Right. You might be sacrificing a party. You might be sacrificing spending time with your girlfriend. But in reality, have you had to give up your life for something or someone? No, you haven't. And ultimately, that's kind of why we're all here is Jesus gave his life for all of us, right? So put it into perspective as well. I know that seems like, uh, I mean, that seems a little drastic, but that's just the reality of it. That's the truth. So um, put it into perspective. And like you said, I mean, you are going to feel lonely, but if you're being, in order to be different, I mean, in order to make a difference, you have to be different, right? So you might get out, you're going to have to make sacrifices. You're going to have to be lonely. You might not be the cool kid at school, but at the end of the day, everybody's going to want to be you. So the, the, the view at the top is, is lonely. So get used to it. And on top of all of those things that you needed to juggle, I know that all three of you are involved, were involved in community service. That was really important to all of you. So we'll start with John this time and work our way back. Um, why was that important? Why would you say that community service is so important to you? Yeah, I think Zach just hit on it, the perspective. Um, when you believe that Jesus Christ gave himself up for you, and that's the, the lens through you view the whole world that, you know, giving back to a community and, and serving kids or whatever it is just seems like a small and insignificant task to do. Um, in comparison to what Jesus did for us. So I think it really comes down to that perspective of just always knowing that Jesus loves you more than anything. Um, And he gave his his life up for you. And so you're called to do the same. You're called to serve and give uh, back with what you've been given. So I think that's really what it comes down to. Amen. Zach. Yeah, and I think uh, after every time I do a community service event, I'm sure these guys would agree, I always felt like I received way more than I gave every single time, no matter what it was. And I think that's, like John said, the perspective aspect of it, but also, you know, you you can get so bottled up with all the monotony of a day, whether it's work, emails, you know, with school, studying, football, sports, whatever it is, but at the end of the day, there's people out there in need, and when you go and do something for someone else, in turn, you start to realize, like, okay, like, I have it so good. I'm so blessed. Like we were just talking about Haiti earlier, right? And you just, you put things into perspective on how good we have things. And um, it's a great reset to realize how fortunate we are. Yeah. Now these guys hit the nail on the head. I think when, when Jesus comes into your your heart and life, all of a sudden everything, you you realize you don't really own anything, right? You, all of a sudden you're a steward. We hear that word stewardship thrown around. Stewardship just means to take care of something, right? So now all of a sudden, whether it's my, my time, my financial resources, my you know, football talents, academic talents, whatever it is, all of a sudden now I'm, I'm this conduit. I'm, I have to steward those things, right? I have to answer the question, what am, I, what am I doing with this platform of football? What am I doing with my time? Whatever it is, um, and are those things showing what I believe, right? And so I, I think for a lot of us, it was simply taking that mindset and having that outpouring of um, this, this is um, how I show a watching world um, because right or wrong, right, wrong, or indifferent, I mean, people pay attention to what the quarterback says or does. You know, it's, I'm not saying that's the right thing, but it, it is our society. And so, therefore, what are you doing with that? What are you saying with that? How are you, how are you modeling your faith? 
um, and, and giving back and serving is an, just that outpouring, I think. Wonderful perspective by all three of you. Makes me proud to be a Bronco. <laughs> um, next question, let's talk about injuries. And I know that a lot of you, is, is not, you're not a stranger to injuries. Um, both you, Tim, and John had season-ending injuries at, at one point. And I know, Zach, you've had some injuries too. Never got hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so, Just kidding. <laughs> How did those experiences affect you um, physically, mentally, and spiritually, John? Yeah, so um, for me, um, my first two years, I didn't play a snap at all because obviously Zach was the starter then. He was a stud, so I wasn't going to see the field for a couple years. But So my, my uh, third year, um, I think it was the seventh or eighth game of the season, I ended up breaking my collarbone and I was out for the rest of the year. And then the next year I came back and about the eighth or ninth game that year, um, I had a season ending foot injury. So two years in a row I had season ending injuries. Um, yeah, I think physically, obviously, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a long road at, you know, at some point to just try to get your, uh, get yourself back in the shape that you were. Um, you know, physically it's tough. Mentally, um, it's definitely tough as well. Um, just knowing, I think both years, you know, we were we were do, playing pretty well, and we had a chance to potentially play for a conference championship. I think one year we were like five and three, and the next year we were six and two. Um, so it kind of stunk, you know, sitting out the rest of the year, not not being able to help the team. Um, but I I really think what held uh, what held me all together was really my faith, just knowing that. Um, just the perspective of how nice we have it, you know, a big disappointment of just not being with the football seems like a big deal, but I mean, in the grand scheme of things, um, just the fact that I was able to play football and play college football is just an amazing blessing. Um, so yeah, those things were, were tough to go through, but they, in the end, they, um, produced perseverance for me to fight through th some things, and, um, in the end, it made me a better person and a better player, so... I'm thankful for those. Mm -hmm. Zach? Yeah, I mean, most people don't, probably don't know, but my redshirt junior year, I had a severe sprain, and I couldn't even walk on the field. So I remember, John, I didn't even practice, really, most of the season because I sprained my ankle versus Michigan State, and we had to play Georgia Southern, who went 11-2 and two or whatever, and then we had to play uh, Ohio State, who won the national championship that year, and I couldn't even walk. And I just remember being like, I don't really know why I'm out here, but just having the opportunity, despite all the things you're going through, you know, that word perseverance comes up and um, just getting the opportunity to fight through pain. And I'm, I, you know, you just bring it all back full circle and you really start to realize like what we can handle physically, but what we can handle mentally and um, how we can get through things. And um, I think that's just the biggest things that I learned. And, you know, my dad always was like, never let your backup see the field. And in hindsight, I probably should have let John play because I couldn't walk. But <laughs> I didn't knew for a fact I didn't want him to see the field because I wasn't, wasn't probably going to ever play again. So, um, but uh, mentally, I really found out, you know, how tough I really could be and what I could persevere through. Zach. Let me start. Oh, oh you're good. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it was kind of an injury roller coaster. My first season, um, I, I did end up playing as a freshman, and then I, I tore three ligaments in my right knee in the final game, um, which caused me to redshirt a year. So I sat out my second year. Um, my third year, I came back healthy, um, but I was struggling early on, kind of had a stepped weird during training camp, had this pain in my foot that kind of would come and go, and had a partial fracture in um, the outside of my foot in the fifth metatarsal called a Jones fracture. And so I was able to play through that, but I did have surgery at the end of the year. And then in 2008, in that same Illinois game, um, I kind of got rolled up, you know, trying to just throw the ball away on a third down and um, kind of had a little bit of instability, wasn't quite sure. And I, I ended up finding out that I had tore the ACL on my other knee. Um, I was able to kind of gimp through it for three, four games, whatever we had left. And, and then I had surgery again. So um, I was just like a... You just wanted to get out of winter conditioning. Exactly. I didn't, I didn't do any winter conditioning <laughs> or spring ball for that matter. I just rode the bike. Um, so I, my senior year, I looked like an offensive guard. I had like two like big Donjoy braces on. It was it was a mess. But you know, there there was a verse that really um, I, I still draw to mind. You know, Romans five three through five talks about you know perseverance produces character, character produces hope. And if our hope is properly placed, you know, in our in the Lord, um, 
that hope will never disappoint us. It won't let us down. And so, you know, that I, I think learning that the hard way, um, asking yourself the question, like, is this faith I claim really mine? Do I really believe it? Um, and I think the other thing is just the way you conduct yourself when you're going through a hard time. Um, you know, being the leader of a team as a quarterback, um, you know, if you're pouting around the training room doing your rehab while other guys are practicing, that sends a strong message. Um, people are watching. Um, and I kind of had to learn that the hard way the first time around. But I think going through that and, and how you conducted yourself going through the hard time um, ultimately, I think, earned respect and leadership. But it's, that's a critical time when you're going through something tough. How do you handle that? So how did FCA and having a chaplain as a resource help you through those circumstances? We'll start with you, Zach. Well, I think me and Craig were in a boot at the same time, if I remember correctly. <laughs> I think we were. So obviously FCA, I mean, not even when you're hurt, but just all throughout my whole college experience uh, played a huge role. Um, just spiritual development, but also, you know, bad company corrupts good character. But when you surround yourself with like-minded individuals and people that um, have the same spiritual goals in mind, um, and people that most of them are athletes, they're going to push you also physically. Um, it's really, it's kind of hard to describe. There's really nothing like it, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I've been in a lot of Bible studies, but not a lot of people truly understand what it takes to um, perform at a high level. And a lot of people, not a lot of people know what you're going through, but all those people have the same type of, you know, time restraints. They're all, you know, let's be honest, every, every time you start a sport, you're, that's, once you start, that's the last time you're fully healthy. So everybody knows what it feels like. Everybody understands the academic time that you have to put in. And it's just, it's just great to have individuals like that together. And then on top of it, everybody loves Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that a lot of people struggle to find on a college campus. And fortunately enough, you have people that a lot of people look towards that are athletes. So it's great to find people like that and to grow and serve and then also have an impact at the school and in the community because it becomes a movement. It really does. You know, Tim and Michelle, they really kind of got FCA started on campus and they got it rolling. And then, you know, it, he passed it down to his roommate, Scott Gaius. And then I, I get there and then we start get it rolling. And now look where Pastor Craig and John have taken it. And it just keeps building. It's, you know, God has this effect where it's, just, it's contagious, right? And um, it all starts with, you know, persevering and, you know, in times of difficulty, you know, whether it's knee injuries, whether it's one in 11, whether it's, you know, back-to-back -back injury, whatever it is, it's just great to have an organization like this where, you know, you can have an impact and where you can also grow and be challenged and be held accountable because that's one of the biggest pieces is accountability. That's what I think the A is, even though <laughs> it's not. But. Jen, what's, what's your perspective? Yeah, I think FCA and Pastor Craig, um, I just think stability and just being a rock um, all the time. You know, I got a story about Pastor Craig. I think it was right before I went into my, oh, it's, a good, it's a good story. <laughs> they can um, cut the cameras off in a second you can tell the bad one um right before i went in for, i think it was my first surgery on my foot um you know my my mom was there with me before the surgery and, and pastor craig showed up and i was just like wow like he's a, just a tremendous person and and just a rock just you know he he had uh he prayed with me before and had a couple verses to share, and I just really remember that moment just because he really cares about um, all the guys on the team and, and how they're doing spiritually and, and with football, too, and stuff like that, but he, he really dives into the people and really wants to give back, so I just, I just think of FCA, and like Zach said, it's just a really good place to go with a community of believers and have a stable environment when, you know, maybe football is maybe not going quite as what you, what you wanted it to, or you know, you're going through stuff with school or any sort of that thing. It's just really a, a stabilizing thing in your life. And so, um, yeah, that, that's kind of what I would describe it. Awesome. I think it's all of the above. I mean, um, we had a team chaplain. We were talking about him last night, sharing memories. Randy Burnett, um, who has since gone home to be with the Lord, um, was the chaplain that handed the baton to Craig, but he was there when I played. And um, he was a part of our wedding. You know, I mean, he, he was there to, you know, I remember the first surgery I had, you know, Terry Nelson was the surgeon. Many people probably know him or have, he's worked on you too. Um, and uh, 
he, he was a believer. Our team chaplain's there. My family's there. I mean, what a comfort, you know, going in the first time you've ever had surgery. You're 19, 18, 19 years old. Um, and I just think community. I think we grow in the Lord most in community. And Zach nailed it. I mean, you have people going through the exact same stuff who are seeking the Lord, and you're all together, and you can share openly. I mean, it's just really powerful. We'll bring you into the conversation now, Craig. I know you've been sitting there quietly. Um, can you share your perspective about being a chaplain for uh, these guys and others and how you are able to walk alongside of them and, and their challenges and their injuries and their, all the things they go through? Well, it's a, it's a joy and a privilege to be able to work with uh, student athletes at Western Michigan, and these guys are special to me. Um, I invest a lot of time just being there, uh, kind of a ministry of presence, I guess, with uh, our football team. And uh, a lot of these guys have endured and persevered because uh, they've come to me and they've said, hey, you know, what do I do here? And uh, all of them have been open to hear what God has to say, God's perspective on, uh, on you know, suffering and, and pain and injury. And uh, yeah, I've taken, taken them to the word and let the word of God speak to them, knowing that, you know, uh, as it says in, in, the, in the Bible, that all things that are happening to us, um, God causes all things to work together for good, for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. That, that might be one verse I might share, but um, been able to integrate scripture into their life. I have, a, I have a story about each of the guys, quick ones, and memory, and I, I just want to share it because I want you to understand the intensity and um, the dedication these guys have. You don't know the time that they invest, not only in practice. I, I go to practices, and you know, I go to training tables, and I, I, and, and, but these guys are in film rooms, they're in meetings, they're doing all kinds of things, they're serving God. Um, just the dedication, but I, I just want you to understand the intensity of all these guys. And, and I, I think I'll just start with John. I can still remember when John got hurt, um, when, he, when he hurt his, his foot. And uh, I, I believe we were playing Toledo, and I believe it was the first quarter. And um, we always wanted John to slide, but John is so competitive, he didn't like sliding. I, I don't know why. And uh, I can still remember him running this and, and I saw in his eyes that he was going to try to stretch himself and run for a first down up the sideline. And uh, I was standing right there. I looked into his eyes, and I could just see, I'm not going to not get this first down. And uh, two guys just slammed him right, right, right on the sideline and rolled on top of his, uh, on top of his ankle. But I saw the intensity of, of his desire. And, and that's the way all these guys are. A desire to be competitive, a desire to win, a desire to give everything that they have, to do their work heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. And that's the quality that they had. And then I, then I think back to Zach. And there's a lot of things. I was actually going to mention when he hurt his ankle because I saw him when he couldn't even walk. And yet he was, he was still playing. But one thing about Zach that was always true is... We would be in situations like third and seven, and somehow Zach always found a way to find, uh, found a way to pick up third and seven. Third and five, he always Crazy found a legs. way. Crazy legs. And, and I'm going to tell you something right now. Zach is not the fastest guy on the team. It's just true. But he, he knew exactly what he needed to get, and he always, always seemed to pick it up. And then I'm going to tell you a story about Tim. Now, Tim, I've known Tim for a long time, but I wasn't the chaplain when Tim was here. My friend Randy was. And, but I knew Tim, and uh, Tim, in 207, was playing a game against my alma, alma mater, the Iowa Hawkeyes, in November of all times. And uh, I think it was like November 19th. And um, they went into Kinnick Stadium in Iowa City. And uh, so, Tim, what would have you been, a sophomore or a yeah, a sophomore. And um, Tim shredded the Hawkeyes. He completed 26 passes for 367 yards and three touchdowns. And it wafted back to me from Iowa City that all the fans were saying, why didn't we recruit that Hiller kid? <laughs> the Iowa quarterback threw two critical in interceptions that game. 
And that's just the kind of guys they are. And I remember these stories, um, and, and I remember seeing them. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been great to be invested in their lives, to, to have a part of their lives, to be able to, to talk to them about spiritual things. Lots of times, we don't always talk about spiritual things. We just talk about life, and we get together. And I think they know that, that I'm there for them whenever they need it. And, um, and that, that's very rewarding, and I appreciate it. Thanks for sharing those stories. You can see the passion that you have for uh, ministering to these students. It's, it's awesome to see. Let's talk about relationships. I know that relationships is a huge part of not only college life, but also being a teammate and a team member. Um, so how does your faith play a role in your relationships with your former teammates and also some of the students that you've come in contact with? We'll start with you. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to a cultural example because it's top of mind. You know, we, we all know we're in a time of um, tense racial relations in our country. You know, there's no way around it. And I, this, this, I just, it brings a tear to my eye to think about it. I, about two days after the George Floyd incident, I found myself on a group text with as many people as are allowed on an Apple iPhone group text that all played together at Western and probably 70% of the guys on that particular text, which was started by one of my teammates, a guy named EJ Biggers, he started it, were African American. And here we are, and we're, we're telling each other we love each other. And we're telling each other we care about each other. And we're telling each other, you know, I'm here for you if you need something. And then we're, you know, making jokes about coaches and laughing at memories. And, and I just, it, and I'm still on it, and I'm still, you know, I have to mute it because I get like 50 a day, it seems like, on that text. But... Like, that is just, no racism could exist in that situation. I remember, you know, when I, when I was playing, you know, big right tackle, big left tackle. Big right tackle is a guy named James Blair, 6'4", 300 pounds, Detroit Pershing High School. You know, grew, had a hard life growing up. And he was fighting his tail off for me, and I was fighting my tail off for him. And our lives couldn't be more different. Our upbringings couldn't be more different. And, and yet, there's that bond, right, that surpasses all these things that we're working through as a nation. And, and I just, like... It's amazing. It's so cool. I feel so, um, so thankful for those type of situations. And I think sports can do that. Awesome. How about you, Zach? Yeah, I mean, I think if our communities were more like a locker room, I think we'd be a way better place. Um, that's an awesome story. We have got a lot of similar ones. But the way I, what I like to think of is I think as at my time, as things started going and, um, you know, our, our boat started moving, it, FCA became a bigger and more important part in our team. And uh, we really started, there really started to become a movement, really, within our football program. I think at, at one time, I mean, I don't know how many, 70 guys out of 105 were showing up to FCA. And um, it was pretty incredible, but it's the guys who didn't show up that I've had cooler conversations with since. And there was guys, like I had guys that would promise me, like, hey, Zach, I'll show up one time. I promise the last FCA I'll show up. And, you know, I'm so excited to see them show up that last, you know, right before the last game or whatever it is or whenever they're going to take off and they don't show up. And I'm crushed by it, right? And um, I got a text message, this probably two months ago, um, from Daniel Braverman. So Daniel Braverman was a Jewish All-American at Western Michigan University. And um, he texted me, said, hey, Zach, I remember all those times that you invited FCA, the example you were for me. You know, you were always a brother. You never pressured me. I just want you to know that I accepted the Lord. I've given up all my sins. I've changed. I've a whole new man, blah, blah. Got to send him his first Bible, a couple books, and he is just absolutely on fire for the Lord. So a guy that was a Jewish All-American is now on fire for the Lord just because of the example that teammates set for him. And FCA, just the encouragement to come and maybe put a little bit of positive pressure on somebody to make a decision. Now it didn't pay off, you know, and often we don't get to find, the fr find out the fruits of our labor, but um, that was one of the coolest relationships. I mean, he was one of my best friends in college. We went on spring break a couple times together, um, and it was just awesome to kind of see that come to fruition and a guy like that who was, I mean, an absolute stud for us on the field now is having an impact in Florida with kids that are going to go throughout the college ranks, and he's... I mean, he's got to spread Jesus, and it's, that's just, it's amazing to me. So that's my, that's my special relationship for sure. That's an awesome story. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, um, I think 
Um, just looking back on college, you know, sometimes people ask you about college, you know, what was your biggest experience or takeaway that has helped you going forward in life? And I think I go back to kind of what, you know, Tim and Zach were talking about. Um, the coolest thing, as Tim was saying, is, you know, how the locker room works. You know, you, you build relationships with people from all different races, backgrounds. It doesn't matter. Um, and, th and that's the thing that's helped me the most in life, um, really be able to build those relationships with people that are a lot different than me. Um, that really helps me in my professional life, my family life, whatever it is. Hopefully with my kids someday, those experiences will really help me parent them. Um, and, and like Zach was saying too, I think relationships, just at the essence of the Christian faith, you know, Jesus really wants to have an in-depth relationship with all of us. And I think at the core of our beings, relationships is really where Jesus wants us to be. He wants us to build relationships with other people just like he wants to have a relationship with us. And so those, those relationships with teammates and coaches and um, those are really the coolest things that as I look back on college that really made it a lot of fun and a lot of, a lot of meaning behind what we were doing. So let's drill down into the FCA huddle on campus and your relationships there with not only teammates but also um, people who played other sports. Can you talk about your relationship with the people that you've made through that um, aspect of FCA? Um, Zach, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so it's not even just other athletes. It's non-athletes as well. I think that's kind of the cool part. You know, I see Salim in, uh, here and a couple other people. So, I, I mean, there's, uh, it's not just athletes. That's the cool part. It's people that um, from all different backgrounds, I'll think of one person in particular, a relationship that we made. We used to meet uh, as an FCA leadership team at Moe's. We'd meet at Moe's, what was it, every Monday or Tuesday or something like that, and we'd get together and we'd kind of go um, through a, a book of the Bible, and we would also talk about the upcoming FCA, make sure we were prepared, make sure we had everything that we needed, and um, over time, eating at Moe's, uh, we ran into this gentleman. We kept seeing him every time we were there. Uh, his name was Craig. Well, we call him Craig Greg because we couldn't figure out whether his name was Craig or Greg for the <laughs> longest time, so he's still Craig Greg to us, so every time he calls me, Craig Greg. So I actually don't know which one it is. I'm pretty sure it's Craig, but um, uh, I think it's Greg. Okay, maybe it's Craig. Uh, so, but Craig Greg joined our FCA huddle for the longest time um, with just the leaders. Ended up accepting Christ, and uh, he might still does he? I mean, he probably still shows up to FCA. I mean, he did all throughout did, my, yeah. he still yeah. does. So he still shows up to FCA, uh, Craig Gregg, and ended up rolling at Western after meeting all of us. Uh, he's uh, in his 30s, and, uh, but just an awesome guy. Just a, you know, you never know what to expect. You never know who Jesus is going to bring in to FCA, but that's just the cool part. You know I mean, it's open arms just like Jesus was. Everybody's welcome. John, your perspective on the huddle? Yeah, the huddle is great. Um, I think... When Zach was still there, I think there was, um, was when we started a Bible study outside of FCA even. So really our FCA huddle got so um, kind of big and, and people were just loving it so much, just what we were doing, diving into the Bible and relationships that people were longing for Bible studies. And so I think, what, what did we have, like two a week? Yeah, two a week. Two a week. We, you know, we started holding two Bible studies a week outside of FCA. I think we had a Bible study on Tuesday and Thursday, and then FCA was Wednesday night. It was just really cool to see the growth of people just wanting to dive into the Word um, outside of FCA. You know, going to FCA and going to church on Sunday is great too, but, you know, the, just the longing that people had to really dive in was just really cool to see that grow. Um, so that's one of the things I remember looking back at the FCA huddle. You know, the, I guess the top of mind thing, Craig and I talked on the phone a little bit last night and shared some memories and, and reflected back. You know, when I, my first two years at Western, um, we, we didn't have FCA. So um, a good friend of all of ours, Dick Schultz, who's a legendary coach at Kalamazoo Valley Community College, um, was an assistant at Western when Western basketball went to the Sweet 16 in the late 70s. And he had the chance to stay on as a head coach. But during those years, FCA was really strong. And when, um, when he left to coach elsewhere, the huddle kind of fell by the wayside. And... Um, it just kind of needed a rekindling. And we were talking last night, you know, I remember the first night we met, I, I think it was 06, 07, probably 2007, um, like 40 people came the first night. And so I think what, what, you know, we came to see is evidenced by what these guys are saying too, is there's just a hunger out there. 
there's just a, a yearning um, for purpose, for um, something to live for. And whether it's Craig Gregg or whether it's uh, someone on campus or, you know, we had some members of the marching band that, that came and were very active and engaged. And actually their music, musical talents led us to do um, kind of a, a pack the house night, we called it, where we'd, we'd go up to Canley Chapel and invite, you know, people outside of FCA to come and they would, you know, get a worship band together because they had those gifts and talents we didn't. Um, and so, you know, I just, I think the network of, of people striving for, for the same thing is just really powerful. That's just too awesome. So let's talk about legacy. I know that um, there's been a legacy of, of amazing Christian quarterbacks uh, for Western Michigan University. And I just wanted to know how did um, the guy that came before you impact you um, and your motivation, your leadership qualities, and your spiritual life? We'll start with you, Tim. I don't know if I can answer that. Um, I'm being 10 years older than John. Holy cow. Um, makes me feel, you made me feel really old. Um, you know, I, I guess for me, um, I do have to credit the coach I played for a lot. And I, Zach, you played for him for a year too. I mean, I, Zach and I have talked about this before. I think we're just, we didn't get a whole lot of opportunities um, in terms of scholarship offers and things. And so to, you know, the only Division One offer I got was Western Michigan. I had an injury my senior year and made some opportunities go away. And so I think uh, an attitude of gratitude is something that comes to mind. And then, um, you know, the guy that, that played before me was a fifth-year senior. And we didn't necessarily connect maybe on a spiritual level, but um, I was hanging on his every word trying to learn the offense. I was trying to um, soak up what, to, what it took in terms of work ethic and habits um, to, to be a starting quarterback, and then hopefully I just tried to make it my own and be a good example. You know, I, I think it was really just, for me, that simple. Okay, Zach. Yeah, for me, um, the quarterback that before, um, that was a senior when I got there, um, I quickly realized that that was not gonna be my role model. So uh, this is a testament to legacy when it comes to Tim, is I, I had kind of reached out to people like who should I model myself after in terms of a quarterback as somebody in the community and everybody kept saying you need to talk to Tim you need to talk to Tim you need to talk to Tim and um, the special thing about Tim is he just kind of became just an open resource for me I think we got together and he just kind of shared his heart and just was an encourager to me and um, as a guy who was a, is a Hall of Famer for Western and had a tremendous career and something that I wanted um, not, o not only spiritually, little did I know spiritually at the time, but you know, in terms of an athletic career, I wanted to emulate the success that he had. And um, you know, that's what you talk about Christian legacy. I mean, I really looked at Tim as the person who started it. And um, I just tried to um, you know, carry that on and I, I don't know if I did nearly as good of a job as Tim, but um, he really set the standard. Crushed all the records. So he really did set the standard, so, um, which made really big shoes to fill. But also he kind of gave us the, I mean, he had to be the pioneer. He had to pave the way for us. So he had the difficult task of not having someone to look up to where I had the fortune of having Tim. And um, fortunately to him, he set the legacy and hopefully it continues on because of him. Yeah, for me, I'm, as you can see, I was very blessed and fortunate to have these two guys come before me. Um, Zach, on a very day-to-day -day basis, you know, me and Zach were on the team together for two years. Um, but I even remember going back to high school, and one of my high school coaches, football coaches, was from Kalamazoo. And I remember him, when I made the decision to go to Western, he's like, um, you got to reach out to Tim Hiller. Um, and so Tim kind of like Zach had, you know, Tim was always an open resource to, uh, for me, which was awesome. But especially Zach, um, I really just tried to emulate Zach, to be quite honest with you. You know, Zach was a tremendous player, football, and he was just an awesome spiritual leader on our team. And so I was just very blessed to have Zach, really. He was a great role, role model for me. Um, yeah, so thanks, Zach. I mean, it You're was... You're going to make me cry. <laughs> You could don't say any of the bad stuff. Just stop right there. Just don't keep talking. You just stop right there. Yeah, we'll stop. That's there. perfect. <laughs> you see me at my worst, for sure. So, do you guys still encourage one another now that you're graduated? Do you still keep in communication, encourage one another, and do you also um, have any contact with current Broncos and encourage them? Um, John, why don't we start with you? 
Yeah, we do um, have some contact. I think this is a couple months ago, but I think me and my wife went over to Tim's for dinner. I don't know how long ago it was, but we, you know, um, we still stay in touch. You know, me and Zach occasionally stay in touch. I got to get over to your house. Um, I only have an apartment yet, so sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't really know what to do, but <laughs> once I'm living on a lake like Zach, maybe I'll have you guys over. But <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, we, um, you know, like I said, I mean, I'm very fortunate to have these two guys, and um, yeah, I think hopefully we continue to stay in touch. I mean, these are two guys that I really enjoy being around and are great role models for me. So, uh, yeah, we still do a little bit. Zach. Yeah, and uh, I mean, obviously, keep in touch with the both of them. Last time John was at my house, he broke my dock, but that's a side note. Um, <laughs> I haven't forgotten. And uh, But, you know, in terms of the, the current players, we absolutely do. I mean, uh, I think all of us got to do a Zoom call with uh, the current quarterbacks, with the state of everything this year. So um, we do keep in touch, and we try to be a resource. We generally, the three of us, get dragged back to stuff. This we like to do, but other stuff, they just like to show us around like we're pieces of meat. But uh, um, we, uh, we do try to keep in touch with the, the, all the cor- current quarterbacks in the football season. We always, me and Tim, get to spend a lot of time together um, at the games, and then we look forward to John when we get back to playing football. But, yeah, we, we keep in touch, and... I mean, we're going to be connected forever. Yeah, just I think there's a, a common bond that, you know, we, we want to see Western be successful. Um, you know, you, you have a certain sense of pride in your alma mater and FCA. Um, and these guys are an encouragement to me. I mean, it was really amazing uh, as Michelle and I moved on to, to see Zach take leadership of the huddle and then to see John stepping in and, and to see FCA continue to do well. Um, it's, it's just really neat to have that common connection. Um, and, you know, right now, I mean, um, Tim Lester, the current head coach, coached me for a couple of years. And so I, I feel old and also, <laughs> again, um, but also kind of that come full circle piece. It's, it's pretty special to um, see another Bronco quarterback at the helm um, right now. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's just such a blessing to be a part of this university and, and have these experiences. Awesome. Well, we're going to wrap it up soon here. And I I uh, just wanted to mention, I mean, as we listen to the three quarterbacks here, I know that we are sensing a common bond between these three, not only uh, because you're quarterbacks, but also because you're brothers in Christ. Um, Craig, can you talk more about the bond of, of Christianity and how that can be av- made available to others if they have questions? Sure. Um, I would like to say just this. I've had the opportunity to go to John's wedding and Zach's wedding didn't make it to Tim's. And uh, their weddings were a great testimony to their teammates about what it is to marry as Christians and uh, to worship in marriage. And um, I I don't know how many teammates came to John's wedding. I think I counted about 29. And um, had many of these young men say to me they had never seen a wedding in their lifetime. And so the relationships that these guys make and the, the quality of them and just what they've shown as, uh, you know, Christ followers. But the bond that we have, and I think you all sense this just hearing these guys, is really the gospel. And the gospel is this, that God has created us for himself and he loves us. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Jesus himself said this, he said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and your son whom you have sent. But a lot of people don't have that experience with God. They don't have that relationship with God. They don't understand a purpose that God might have. And the reason for that is that all humanity is sinful and separated from God and therefore can't know and experience the love, the plan, the purpose that God has for their lives. The Bible teaches us this, that all have sinned and we fall short of God's perfection of his glory. That the wages of our sin is separation from God. That's spiritual separation. That's the fact that we can't come to God. 
And it's problematic because a lot of people are trying to figure out how does God fit into my life? But the good news is this, is that Jesus Christ has come and Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. The Bible says that God has demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel that Jesus had died, has died for us. Christ suffered on the cross, on the tree, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. There's a famous French physicist, mathematician, philosopher by the name of Blaise Pascal. And he said this many centuries ago. He said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man that cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through his son, Jesus Christ. And I think what's problematic today is people are trying to fill a vacuum that God only can fill. And they try to fill it up with fame and sex and drugs and alcohol, whatever it might be. Maybe it's just success, who knows? And yet that vacuum can only be filled by God through Jesus himself. And you know, you can know all these things. A lot of us here probably know all those things. We've heard these things. We've been to church. Maybe we're not in church now. Uh, it's kind of trickled down to us, but it's not enough just to know that stuff. The Bible says that we must each individually believe and receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. And then we can know God. And then we can experience his plan and purpose for our lives. The Bible says this. It says, for by grace, which is God's unmerited favor, you've been saved through your belief or your faith. And that's not of yourselves, but it's a gift of God. Not a, as a result of any works that you can do, just in case anybody wants to boast. As many as received him, John says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And the critical issue is this. Have you trusted Christ with your life? Have you recognized that you're separated from God because of your own sin, because of your independence, often demonstrated by active rebellion against God, sometimes passive indifference. But that's what the Bible calls sin. And we need to come to Christ and believe in him and know that he has accomplished on the cross our forgiveness and our salvation, and we need to believe. And that's the gospel, friends. And that's what unites these guys. That's what the bond is. One of the great church fathers, Augustine, said this. He said, Thou, God, thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. And I think all of these men up here would say, the challenge today is, Will you find rest for your soul and your purpose in life when you come to believe in all that God is for you in Jesus Christ? That's the gospel. Amen. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. And thank you, guys. Why don't we give these guys a hand, a round of applause. <laughs> so we've ticked past 8 o'clock, but... If you guys have any questions that I didn't ask that you want uh, these guys to answer, you can go ahead and yell it out. This isn't so much a question. This is just a statement. Tim, smile over there. Um, I've been around the Western Athletic Center for football for 40 years. So I've seen the thing up in fall. And all three of those young men up there, when they were there, Beyond any other, as Pastor Craig just shared. So if you would not make your
Amen. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else have any questions or comments that you'd like to give these guys? Um, I was just, there's a couple of guys on the team here tonight, uh, Boone and Eric for sure. I don't know, I don't know if I see, are there any others, Eric or Boone? I think those are the only two guys, but um, just talking with them beforehand, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, I think you guys are probably, it seems like they're pretty frustrated a little bit. Um, just basically, I think the Pac-12 and the MAC are like the two conferences that aren't playing football. Um, so I think the spirit in, is a little bit down on the team right now, just with all that's going on and the uncertainty um, and just frustration building up of not being able to play. Um, you know, because that's, you know, we all love football um, and we want, you know, they want to play. And um, so I think that's kind of the overall morale of the team right now, I think. Anyone else? Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time out to come in and spend time with us and share from your heart. And uh, thank you guys for coming out as well and participating in this. Uh, why don't you all just have a nice, safe drive home? And um, I guess you guys might be hanging out a little bit afterwards, maybe. If, if you want to talk to them personally, I'm sure they'll be around. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you.